OK, so uh, I really want to prove Chigurh's inequality, but I will not have time. So therefore, it'll either be on homework, or it'll be maybe some kind of like bonus video. But it's not too hard to prove. It's kind of entertaining thing in spectral graph theory. Uh, OK, so what I want to get to for the remainder of the lecture is this discussion of uh, mixing time in the graph, for the random walk in the graph. And one thing that we've sort of seen now is that lambda 1, this smallest non-zero eigenvalue of L, is like a good proxy for this minimum conductance uh, in the graph, the size of the minimum, uh, the conductance of the minimum conductance set. So it sort of suggests that uh, if lambda 1 is quote unquote large, like maybe like at least 0.1 or something, that there are no bad bottlenecks for the random walk. And therefore, you might hope that a random walk will, as I say, mix fast, which means uh, have the property that um, after a small number of steps, the distribution of where you are is close to the stationary distribution. So uh, the idea slash hope is that lambda 1 being quote unquote large should imply you know, fast mixing of random walks. And uh, this is basically true, but uh, there's like one slight annoyance. It's basically to do with um, bipartite graphs. Uh, so like a bipartite graph has this annoying even odd property, right? If you start on the left side of the vertices and you walk for an even number of steps, you'll always be on the left vertices. And an odd number, you'll always be on the right. So it may well be that the invariant distribution is uniform on all the vertices, but you'll never mix there because you'll always, for any fixed t, you'll either be like always on the left or always on the right. That's like a very stupid annoyance, and it's basically the only thing that's blocking this from being true. So we'll see like a couple of like hacks to get around it. Uh, but before we can quite say these hacks, um, now is the time where it's more convenient to start studying k rather than l. It's a trivial change because like l is i minus k and k is i minus l, but it's good to make this trivial change. So let me now recall we have this uh, k, the transition matrix. Has the same eigenvectors, constantly one function, phi 0 through phi n minus 1. It has eigenvalues, um, uh, 1, which is kappa, I guess this is kappa uh, 0, greater equal to kappa uh, 1 greater or equal to, et cetera, kappa n minus 1. And because the largest possible value for L is, eigenvalue for L is 2, this largest possible value is, or smallest possible value is minus 1. And it's equality, this is a good thing to remember, if G is bipartite. Um, so indeed, this annoying case arises, this bipartite case arises when you have this last eigenvalue being minus 1. And in general, um, negative eigenvalues are like super annoying. So there's a hack to get around them. But uh, OK, so this intuition or hope, uh, we can express the same intuition or hope in terms of the kappas with this relationship. So like, uh, say that large meant like at least epsilon. Well, then the new version of the hope would be if kappa 1 is less than or equal to 1 minus epsilon, this would imply fast mixing. OK, so the hope is that like, you know, the largest eigenvalue of k is kappa 0. It's always 1. The hope is that like, OK, if this, the, the second largest eigenvalue is like kind of far from 1, there's a big gap. That should be equivalent to facts mixing. And because of this bipartite stupidity, it's not quite true. But what is true is that the real condition, or a correct condition, is like all the eigenvalues in absolute value are at most 1 minus epsilon, other than uh, 0, where kappa 0 is always 1. So this one is actually true. And like the point is like. Uh, 
this being bounded away from 1 should lead to fast mixing. But like the annoyance is like if this is minus 1, uh, you're bipartite and you won't have fast mixing. Okay? So you really need this guy to also be bounded away from minus 1. So let me state a theorem that I hope we'll get time to prove that makes this precise. Okay, so say you have some graph, G as always, and say you have this condition that when you look at the transition matrix, which again in the regular case is just the adjacency matrix divided by the degree D, and you check out all its eigenvalues, and they're all bounded away from 1 by like a noticeable amount, epsilon, other than the trivial one, which is always 1. Then, for any worst case starting distribution, row on v, uh, if you do this, first you draw the initial vertex from B, and then you do a t-step random walk. It's a standard random walk. And you make t big enough, so and t is at least some constant, even like 2 is fine, but some constant times uh, log n over epsilon. Then rho t, by which I mean the distribution of u t, is, and this looks all precise, but I'm going to end with an imprecise statement, very close to pi, the stationary distribution. And I will eventually make this very close to precise. But what it's saying is that uh, as long as this epsilon is large, think of it as a, like at least 0.1 or 0.01, then this will be like big O of log n. So it says that even though there are n vertices in the graph, you only have to take exponentially fewer steps in a random walk, like order log n steps, and you'll basically get to the stationary distribution. Or if it's a regular graph, you'll basically get to the uniform distribution. It's kind of infra interesting because let's say it's a graph of regularity 3. It has n vertices. Um, try to think while I'm talking about what the diameter of this graph could be. The diameter being the distance between the two farthest apart points. It, uh, the diameter can't be too small in a three regular graph or a four regular graph. But uh, this random walk mixes quite fast. You just need order log n steps, and you're kind of in the uniform distribution at that point. Uh, let me just make a really brief aside about like, the negative eigenvalues of k are annoying. Uh, maybe I'll just say this uh, in words, and you can read some exact details in the notes. Uh, there's a hack to get around this like annoyance about bipartite graphs and negative eigenvalues of k. And it's called the lazy random walk hack. And what is a lazy random walk? It's just a slight twist on the standard random walk. But in the lazy random walk, at each time step, you flip a coin. With probably a half, you take a random step like normal along an edge. And with probably half, you don't do anything. You just stand still. OK, that's called lazy random walk. And let's make some observations about it. Um, one, it only affects like the, like the running time of your, your random walk by a factor of two in expectation. OK, so uh, you know, what the, random walk, the standard random walk does in time t is kind of comparable to what a lazy random walk does in time 2t. Because basically, you know, half the steps in the lazy random walk are wasted, but otherwise it looks like you're just doing the standard random walk. Uh, so that's good. But what's also good is it like breaks this stupid even odd problem in bipartite graphs. Now, because you don't necessarily take a step in each, like an actual step in each time step, 
If you have a bipartite graph, it's fine. There's no problem. Like half the time you'll stand still, half the time you'll take a walk, so there's no more like odd even thing. And now there's, at least intuitively, very much the possibility that like um, even for bipartite graphs with a worst case starting point or distribution, you know, relatively quickly the random walk will get to the stationary distribution, the invariant distribution. And indeed that's going to be true. So that's great. Another wonderful property of the lazy random walk is it's very easy to relate it to the standard one because, I mean, as a little exercise for you, uh, the transition matrix for the lazy random walk is like a half times i plus a half times the original transition matrix. Seems pretty believable in, in, uh, given the, the definition of it. And in particular, uh, just in the same way we easily deduced the eigenvectors and values of k from l, because it was just shifting by like i, you can similarly do the same thing here. So like, uh, like sort of kappa i for like the lazy version is like a half plus a half kappa i. And that's kind of cool because the, the kappas are all between minus 1 and 1, but if you do this transformation, half plus half times to it, then they stay in their relative order, but they just get like shifted like this. So now they're all between 0 and 1. So that's cool. You no longer have any negative eigenvalues, which annoyed you. It also doesn't change much the gap of the largest one from 1. If like kappa 1 was 1 minus epsilon, then sort of kappa lazy 1 will be 1 minus half epsilon. So like epsilon, half epsilon, no big deal. And then, like, once all your eigenvalues are positive, you don't have to worry about these absolute values anymore. And like, it just matters what kappa 1 is, or just matters what lambda 1 is. So um, this is like an elegant trick for fixing some annoyances. But anyway, we're actually not going to even use this uh, trick. We're just going to go ahead and prove this theorem with uh, the absolute values in here. OK, so I think we have time to prove it. Any questions, though, right now? Yeah? What are the situations in which you wouldn't be able to use the lazy random walk there? Um, there aren't any, really. Um, unless you're like extremely, I mean, some people in probability get like really extremely excited about like nailing the constant factors, like in this here and uh, elsewhere, and in which case then, okay, you've, you, you maybe you'd be unwilling to pay a factor of two. Um, and sometimes like you don't even uh, need to like literally do it, like you can just, in many cases you can just like uh, analyze the standard random walk conveniently by, you can actually do the standard random walk, but like analyze the lazy random walk and say, well, they're going to be the same up to a factor of two. But um, yeah, if, if for example, if you have a bipartite graph, then you better do this. You can also, I mean, there's no particular reason to make this a half either. Like, if you make, you know, the probability of standing still like 1%, you'll still break this even odd problem with the, um, the bipartite graph. Yeah? Pardon me? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's exactly the, there is weirdness with this connected graph, but it's actually not weirdness. It's like correctness in the sense that, like, um, as we saw before, like the disconnected graphs is really the case, that's like, that's like the ultimate bottleneck when you have two connected components. Like it's the ultimate sparsest cut when you have this set S and there's literally zero edges going between it. So actually this is the sort of correctly capturing that situation. As we saw even in the first lecture, like uh, I think, um, or maybe the second one, uh, kappa one equals one and the gap is zero if and only if the graph is disconnected. So that's sort of, then it's sort of exactly right. Like um, it's telling you if kappa 1 equals 1, so this gap epsilon is 0, you're like, you're never going to mix. And like it makes perfect sense because it's disconnected. So in fact, this is like, um, this kind of stuff is like a robustification of that fact. Like it's kind of telling you if kappa 1 does not equal 1, you're connected. That's true. But like if it kind of does not equal 1 in a strong way, like you're kind of far from 1, then you're kind of strongly connected. Uh, like every, there's no like even like very sparse partition, and uh, that's more related to Cheeger's inequality, I guess. But you know, it's also connected to the mixing of random walks. I'm just curious, what happens if your graph is uh, such a cycle which is too regular? Uh, if your graph is a cycle which is too regular, great question. If you have a cycle graph which is uh, too regular. 
So here, uh, you can clearly see the random walk does not mix. You don't get like awesome mixing time, right? Because if you take a random walk on the cycle, it's too regular. So in particular, you know, the uniform distribution is the stationary distribution. But if you take, start you know, from like one particular point on the cycle and start doing a random walk, like, you're definitely not going to get to the uniform distribution until you've at least gone like n steps, because like, you don't even have a chance to get to here, let alone have 1 over n probability mass here until you've taken n steps. So in some sense, that proves to you that the epsilon for this graph must be really small. And indeed it is. You can actually, the cycle graph is like nice enough. You can like calculate an explicit formula for these eigenvalues. And this will be like, oh, I'll now embarrass myself by not remembering if it's 1 over n or 1 over n squared. But I think it's proportional to 1 over n, 1 minus 1 over n squared. Is that right? Somebody in the know? OK, let's say it's right. Um, yeah, that's right. Um, because in fact, uh, people who are in the now know that if you do a random walk on the cycle of length n or on the path graph, which is similar, you have a chance to reach everywhere after n steps, but you don't actually really mix until you take n squared steps. Yeah, so that's a good example of a graph where you don't have a nice gap. I should mention, on the other hand, um, if you have a graph of constant degree, or usually a regular graph, and this gap is large, like at least a universal constant. That's literally the definition of an expander graph. So I'll have a lecture about expander graphs, and I'll get into it more. But like, this is the definition of an expander graph, like a graph where this epsilon is not little o of 1. OK. So I want to prove this theorem. And uh, strangely, we need to take like a little um, digression into one of my favorite topics, but uh, we won't digress far into it. Uh, it's the topic of what's a good way to measure how close one probability distribution is from another one. We can have a whole lecture on this, but I don't think we will. I'll just do a real brief version here. Um, so in this theorem, you know, we're going to be analyzing for a given like uh, row i. Rho i, let's say, is the distribution of the, the random walk after i steps. We're going to want to know things about like, what does it mean rho i is close to pi? And let me just write rho here. Just a, for any generic probability distribution rho, what does it mean for rho to be close to pi? There are many different uh, ways you could quantify it. I'm going to pick one that's like not the most standard, but it's going to be convenient. You could say that rho and pi are close if rho probability mass on u divided by pi's probability mass on u is close to 1 for all u. I mean, that's a reasonable way to say that rho is similar to pi. Uh, and that's still going to be the way we choose. Given rho, I'm going to write this quantity as f of u. You might write it as f sub rho of u, but I'm just going to write f of u here. Okay? And this f of u is a function mapping the vertices to the real numbers. It's a non-negative function. It's actually, for like the math lovers, you can think of it as like the density or relative density of this probability distribution with respect to this one. Um, and my closeness measure, now I'm going to quantify what does it mean for a row to be close to pi. I'll say that the, somehow the distance between rho and pi is um, somehow the average uh, amount by which f deviates from the ideal value 1. Well, as is usual with these things, like I don't care if it's positive or negative, so I'm going to square it because that's nice. And I'm going to take the expectation or average here with respect to pi. So this is a bit funny, but uh, this is going to be my definition of the distance. You can see that it's going to be 0 if and only if f of u is always 1, which is if and only if rho equals pi. So that's nice. This distance has a name. It's called the chi-squared divergence, or chi-squared distance between rho and pi. Um, but we'll just take it. Um, 
If you're a sophisticate, you might already have a favorite way of measuring the distance between two probability distributions. Perhaps you like the total variation distance. In that case, you should prove as an exercise that this is at most, um, this, well, the total variation distance is at most the square root of this. So in particular, if this is small, then so too is the total variation distance. Uh, but if you don't know what total variation distance is, that's fine. You can also relate this to the KL divergence and other measures of closeness. Uh, okay, but this is going to be our definition of closeness between rho and pi. And I want to make one more little observation. This observation is that um, it's not related to this measure per se, but for any probability distribution, if you look at this f, which is like this ratio thing, its expectation is always 1. This expectation is, as always, with respect to pi. And uh, what is the proof of that? I'll write it over here. Well, you just write out the formula, and it proves itself, uh, which I'll do in a second. But this is actually another reason why it's good to call f like a density. If you know a probability density function, right, is like a non-negative function that integrates to 1. That's what we're saying here. But you don't have to say those fancy words if you don't like. Uh, but let me justify this fact. Uh, the point is that the expectation of f of u, just by definition, well, let me write the definition of expectation. It's the sum over all u of pi of u times this thing we're taking the expectation of. Well, by definition, that's rho of u over pi of u. Okay, now these cancel out, and we get sum over u of rho of u. But rho is a probability distribution, so this is 1. And another thing I want to point out is that this expectation of f is f hat 0. We're going to use that uh, in our calculations. That was always true. And a corollary of this fact is now, if we stare at this formula, we have expectation of the square difference between f of u and 1. But I just showed you 1 is always the mean of this f. So we have the expected squared deviation of f from its mean. So this is the variance of f. Okay, it's pretty reasonable, right? This measure of distance is how much this quantity is varying from 1, if you will. And that's kind of cool because we had a, like an a eigenvector eigenvalue coefficient formula for this, right? This was uh, the sum over all i except for 0 of f hat i squared. OK, so any questions? Uh, yeah, you can generalize this to uh, continuous probability distributions of rho and pi. One thing is uh, you always have to take care that you know, uh, rho never puts probability mass on a point that pi doesn't put probability mass on. But one thing we checked a million years ago is our pi's always put non-zero probability mass on every vertex by virtue of having no isolated vertices. OK, so the idea for proving this uh, theorem, let me give myself a little bit of space now that we did this calculation. The idea for proving this theorem is just to uh, track this quantity, the distance of the probability distribution that the vertex is in, like rho 0, rho 1, rho 2, up to rho t, uh, using this formula, this formula here. And we'll just see that as you take steps, uh, this quantity goes down rapidly. Okay, so the proof idea, well, another aspect of the proof idea is instead of tracking uh, 
row 0, row 1, through row t, per se. Remember, uh, row i, for me, is the probability distribution of where you are after i steps the random walk, assuming you started out in a distribution which I should have called row 0. And this should have said row 0. You should have gotten mad at me for making that mistake earlier. OK, so instead of tracking these, we'll instead track these like ratio functions, these density functions. And we want to argue that ft becomes very similar to what function? I assume this is not I want to give the answer, but it is the answer. Yes. We want it to become very close to the constantly one function. right? Because f being the constantly one function is saying that the associated row is equal to pi. So we want to say no matter what f0 is, like pretty soon ft will become the constantly one function. By the way, like I just, uh, no, it's here. Whatever row you have, the expectation will always be 1. Okay? So you want a function that is always going to mean 1, and you want like the variance to go down, 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 down. OK. So uh, say, I guess we're doing the proof now. Say we're given any arbitrary worst case rho 0, and therefore f0. We can write its expansion in the eigenvectors and eigenvalue, eigenvector basis for k. And it always starts out with 1. I guess I no longer have it up there. Well, kind of. I mean, the 0th eigenvector is always phi 0. And the associated coefficient, f hat 0, is equal to the mean of the function. That's a simple formula. But we know it's always going to be 1. So f0 it will always look like 1. And then all the other stuff f hat 1, phi 1, plus f hat 2, phi 2, plus dot dot dot, plus f hat uh, n minus 1, phi n minus 1. Okay? So whatever the starting distribution row 0 is, we look at the associated density, where you basically divide the function by pi. We look at its expansion and the eigenvalue basis. It's going to start with 1 plus and then some linear combination of these other phi's. OK, so that's f0, which we don't have much control over. But now we have f1. So what is f1? Well, uh, any guesses how to express it in terms of f0? Yeah, you may, I don't know if you quite said it, but you may guess correctly that f1 is equal to k applied to f0. This is the transition operator. And uh, I leave that to you as an exercise, or you can read the surprisingly long chain of like seven, inequal seven equalities, which proves this uh, fact. I mean, we saw uh, last lecture that if you have a probability distribution like row 1, and you think of it as a row vector, uh, it's equal to row 0 times k on the right. And like it almost pattern matches, although these f's are actually row divided by pi, and like we're multiplying on the left. But anyway, I assure you, like a trivial calculation will justify this. Yeah? Why does f0 end up on the right? Uh, instead of on the left zero? Yeah, it's funny. Um, because you have this divided by pi in there, uh, I'm wondering if I should just like sprint write the whole proof. It's kind of a bit long, but yeah, it's funny. Like I spent like a while try it on your piece of paper. Like I could not find like a extremely short proof of this. It like took, I don't know, as I said, like seven equalities or something. Um, it kind of uses in a weird way the uh, the self adjointness of k. Anyway, as an exercise in the last uh, 10 minutes while I'm talking, see what the shortest proof you can write for this. But it's, um, at least if you're used to this stuff, which maybe you aren't, but if you're used to this stuff, this feels very believable. Like k is the operator that like, is like, do one step in the random walk. Um, and 
ultimately it's trivial because you can just mechanically write down everything and you'll deduce this. By this time, I could have just written the proof, but um, anyway. Uh, great. OK. We'll see how much time I have. Maybe I'll write it then. Anyway, uh, well, the good news is let's say you believe this, which please do because it's true. Uh, then you're loving life because now you can just easily write a formula for F1, and you can easily write a formula for F2, and so forth. It's kind of we saw this before, right? Um, we deduced from this that F1 is k times F0. I just hit each of these things by k. Well, the constantly one function, when hit by k, stays the constantly one function because constantly one is an eigenvector for k with eigenvalue 1, so we keep this 1. And then the i term here gets multiplied by kappa i. Great. And remember, these kappas are between minus 1 and 1. So in magnitude, you shrunk all the other coefficients. And uh, of course, you will therefore conclude by induction that Ft is 1 plus kappa 1 to the t, uh, f hat 1, phi at 1, plus uh, kappa 2 to the power of t times f hat 2, phi 2 plus kappa dot, kappa n minus 1 to the t, f hat n minus 1, phi n minus 1. And now a great thing has happened, right? Like if these numbers, let's say all these kappas were be strictly between minus 1 and 1. Then you raise them to the power of t, they're like exponentially fast going to 0. Although now you think exactly about these issues, you're like, well, if one of them is not 1, but it's 0.999999999, then you know, that to the power of t doesn't go down to 0 so fast. And indeed, sort of the rate at which they all go down to 0 is controlled by how far each of them is from being away from minus 1 and 1. And why is that relevant? Well, remember, our measure of how close you are to the stationary distribution, this distance, is given by the sum of the squares of the coefficients other than the first coefficient. Whoops. OK, and so therefore we can conclude that this notion of distance between the final, well, the final distribution, rho t, and the limiting distribution, pi, the variance of k, well, of ft, it is. Uh, the sum is i goes from 1 to n minus 1 of kappa i to the 2t f hat i squared. And now let's just upper bound this by its maximum. These are all non-negative, so that's valid. Uh, this is upper bounded by the maximum of kappa i uh, to the power of 2t times uh, the sum of the squares of these guys, which is the sum of the squares uh, in the original f, so times the original distance. OK, and in particular, uh, this quantity, under our assumption that in the absolute value, uh, kappa i is, where's our assumption? Here. Uh, all these kappa i's are bounded away from 1 minus 1 by epsilon. Well, this is at most 1 minus epsilon to the 2t. Or using our favorite approximation, this is at most exponential in minus 2t epsilon. OK, so as long as epsilon is big, by making t suitably big, you know, this factor goes down exponentially against the sort of original distance. Any questions about this? There is sort of one remaining question. I mean, okay, I didn't exactly pin this down. And uh, we didn't exactly pin this down either. Like, what is this original distance? How big could it be? 
could actually be arbitrarily big. But uh, let's now pass to the, uh, well, let's bound it. So um, yet another exercise for you, which is simple. It uses convexity, is if you ask yourself, what is the worst possible starting distribution? It's an exercise to show the worst possible starting distribution will be some distribution of the form 100% probability distribution on a certain vertex. It's pretty believable, right? Like, I'm not saying which vertex, but I'm saying the worst starting distribution will be of the form for some particular vertex u0, put all your probability there. It does seem pretty believable that this is like the least mixed starting distribution, right? It's easy to prove using convexity. So the worst in terms of making this quantity big uh, row zero is of the form. Um, bum, ba -dum, bum, bum. Uh, well, row zero of u zero equals one for some u zero vertex, which means that uh, the associated f zero is uh, has one over pi u zero if u equals u0 and 0 else. And therefore, for this guy, the sort of initial distance, which is the variance under pi of this f0, is at most the expectation of f0 squared. This is under pi, uh, which is, well, this is a very simple function to compute the expected square of with probability pi of u0, you get 1 over pi of u0 squared. And otherwise, you get nothing. So this is 1 over pi u0. Okay, so what it's saying is this quantity, the worst thing it can be is uh, this reciprocal. So in fact, I guess the the largest this could be is if u0 is like a degree 1 vertex, in which case this would be like 1 over 2m. So I guess the largest this could be is 2m. OK, and so you see like uh, t would need to be like log m over epsilon times a constant in order for this to become truly small. Or let's just reduce even to the, like the, the simplest case. If G is, let's say G is regular. Then uh, this one over pi 0, pi of u 0, is this is going to be like n over d. OK, it's at most n. I guess it's not much different from saying it's uh, at most 2m. OK, and therefore, if t is greater than, uh, I don't know, ln n over epsilon, then this distance of rho t from pi, by plugging that in, this t into here, multiplying it by this, um, it's going to be at most n to the minus 2 times n, which is 1 over n. OK, so maybe this is like a notion of very close. So in summary, let's say if you have a regular graph and you start the random walk from any fixed vertex, then after just logarithmic and n over epsilon many steps, and by the way, the diameter of the graph in a you know, constant regular graph is always at least log n, because if your regularity is 3, you can reach at most 3 to, t, 3 to the t vertices in t steps probably even at most 2 to the t vertices in t steps. So to reach everything, you need to take at least log n steps. And this is saying that you're just even, uh, as long as this epsilon is at least a constant, then so the graph is an expander, order log n steps are enough to get you super close, this distance being like 1 over n uh, to the uniform distribution. OK, cool. So uh, that's, as I said, it's kind of it for uh, spectral graph theory, but we'll have a next lecture about expanders after spring break.